All right. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining Arizona Historical Society for tonight's program, The Girl in the Iron Box, How an Arizona Kidnapping Stumped Hoover's FBI. Uh, before we get started, I want to uh, do a couple of introductions and then uh, tell you a little bit more about Arizona Historical Society and our virtual programs. Tonight's uh, program is brought to you by Dr. David Turpey, who will be presenting, and myself uh, at the Arizona Historical Society. Uh, Arizona Historical Society was established uh, uh, by an act of the first territorial legislature on November 7th on 18, in 1864. Uh, the Arizona Historical Society is Arizona's oldest historical agency, and you can see that our flagship museums are on the map. Please come join us. Our mission that we take very seriously here uh, is connecting people through the power of, a his of history, uh, just like today's program and others uh, that we have been bringing uh, to you. Uh, something we're very excited about here is our new uh, Arizona Historical Society license plate is available. Beautiful monsoon. May we get more of those this uh, uh, this summer, uh, but at least you can have it on your car. And remember, a portion of proceeds go to supporting the museum and uh, uh, continue to help us continue to uh, bring these programs to you. As I said, plan your visit to the Arizona Historical Society. Uh, our Arizona History Museum and Arizona Heritage Center are both open. Uh, with social distancing and uh, uh, precautions, so you know, take the take the family out and come visit us. We're very proud of our our new exhibits. Speaking of our new exhibits, uh, we have two upcoming. Uh, first is Unframed: A Photo Journey Through Navajo and Hopi Nations, 1977 through 1978. A new exhibition featuring the photography of artist Catherine McKenna. It opens April 29th, so it's coming up uh, at the Arizona Heritage Center at Papago Park. Uh, very excited to uh, see this one. And then uh, not too much longer, you'll get to see Ready to Launch, Arizona's Place in Space, uh, opening on May 20th uh, through November 30th uh, of this year. And this one will be at the Arizona History Museum in Tucson. So please come and come and see our new exhibits. Uh, we have new uh, virtual programs coming up. The big one next week is Arizona History Convention. Uh, and it's for three days. And small registration fee of $30 will let you get to come in and see as many presentations and panels as you would like. Uh, next is Ask the Author, Seeing Arizona, Imagining Mars by Michael Amundsen, Desert Canals, Global Climate Change in the American West, something uh, very important for today, and that is Thursday, April 29th from 6 to 7 p.m. And next is My House Historic or Just Old, Property Research for the Tucson Area on May 6th from 6 to 7.30. I know that a lot of people are interested in this one, so please join us for our virtual programs. Uh, become a member uh, to get the best deal in history. You get free admission to our museums, 10% at our off at our, our gift shops, and a subscription to the award-winning Journal of Arizona History quarterly issues. Uh, so join today. You can find, uh, get information off of our website. Now available on Project Muse is our double issue. We're extremely proud uh, of this. Uh, come see the leading Arizona historians uh, articles in this uh, in this issue. So if you haven't been able to pick it up, come a member and, and take a look. It's amazing. All right. And add Girl in the Iron Box to your bookshelf. It's available at our, uh, our gift stores uh, in Tucson and Papago Park and the Pioneer Museum. It's also online uh, that you can purchase it through our online store. Uh, so if you enjoy this presentation, come uh, read the book, uh, which gives obviously a little bit more detail than, than we can go into tonight. For more information on anything that I've covered uh, in this, see our uh, website, azhs.org, and keep up to date on our virtual programs. All right, tonight's All right. program, as I said, is The Girl in the Iron Box, How an Arizona Kidnapping Stumped Hoover's FBI. And today our, our presenter will be David Turpey, who is Vice President of Exhibition, Education and Publications and editor of the Journal of Arizona History. David holds a PhD in history from the University of Maine. After teaching college level history in Maine and editing the Journal of Maine History, David moved to the Kentucky Historical Society where he oversaw the State History Journal and KHS Research Fellowship Program. 
At AHS, David edits the Journal of Arizona History, oversees the annual Arizona History Convention, which is next week, and directs a statewide exhibition of education teams. He has published his own research in several journals. David formerly served on the editorial board of the University of Press of Kentucky and currently serves as an editor on the editorial advisory board of the University of Arizona Press. So I want to welcome uh, Dr. David Turpey and let him uh, start the program. So I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen and then he's going to share his screen. So give us just a minute. Dr. Turpey, it's all you. Thank, thank you, Laura. And uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. Um, and let me just share my screen. Uh, sorry, I apologize. My computer is being a little slow. It always happens when we're actually on the presentation. While you do that, I can tell everybody if you have any questions about, uh, you know, that come up during the, the presentation, just type them in the chat box. I will mo monitor them and then ask uh, Dr. Turpey uh, when at the end of the program. So uh, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat box. Okay, it is still. Still being slow. I, I, I apologize. Um, no worries. I, I There we go. There we go. Yay. Okay. Sorry about that. Let me see if it'll let me do the slideshow. Uh, there. Okay. No worries. All right. All right. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. And, and thank you all for, for joining us uh, tonight virtually. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to be here to discuss this book, which the Arizona Historical Society published two years ago uh, in 2019, uh, called The Girl in the Iron Box, How an Arizona Kidnapping Stumped Hoover's FBI. Uh, just to give a little background information before we jump into the story, uh, first, let me just say that I'm not the author of the book. Uh, I worked as the lead editor on it here at the Arizona Historical Society. Uh, the author of the book, as you'll see from, from the cover, uh, is named Paul Kuhl. Uh, Paul unfortunately passed away shortly after finishing the book manuscript, uh, and he was unfortunately not able to see it come out in print. Um, I can tell you that Paul is, was an incredibly gifted writer. Uh, he was able to weave a, a very stirring narrative of historical events uh, in this book, uh, often very complex events. Um, and although this is a work of, of history, uh, for me, it often reads like a novel. Um, so I'm very proud to have worked on this book as an editor, and I'm glad to be here to discuss it with you tonight. All right, so um, let's jump into the, to the story then. Um, June Robles, uh, as, as you'll see from this image, um, a six-year-old girl, she's the, the girl on the, the left, uh, in this image with her parents and her sister, uh, except perhaps in Tucson, June Robles is not a household name today, uh, but she was known around the country in the spring of 1934. On April 25th of that year, six-year-old June was kid kidnapped while walking home from school in Tucson. And, and here's an image uh, of her school um, at the time in the, in the mid-1930s. Uh, and let me just pause here just for a second and say that uh, all but one of these images that I'm going to show you, show you tonight are housed at the Arizona Historical Society archives uh, here in Tucson. Um, so there's some, some pretty incredible images that a local photographer um, took at the time. Uh, so June was kidnapped uh, in late April of 1934 as she was walking home from, from her school here. Uh, newspapers from around the country uh, covered the case. It became an immediate sensation around the country and even around the globe. The kidnappers sent a ransom note to her parents asking for $15,000 uh, payment for her safe return. Uh, here you can see um, at the top there, it mentions the, the $15,000 and, and also gives some instructions about how um, the parents are supposed to deliver it uh, to the kidnappers. In the middle of the Great Depression, uh, $15,000 was a fairly substantial amount of money. Her parents were not capable of 
paying that sum on their own. They were not particularly wealthy, but June's grandfather was wealthy. Bernabe Robles was born in Sonora, Mexico in 1857. He moved with his family to Arizona as a young boy. He had an entrepreneurial streak. He owned several businesses in Southern Arizona before settling on cattle ranching and real estate. By the 1930s, he was reported to be one of the wealthiest men in Tucson. The kidnappers undoubtedly knew that June's grandfather was wealthy and hoped to get the ransom money from him rather than her parents. Once June's parents were alerted to the fact that she was missing on April 25th in 1934, they immediately contacted the local authorities. Uh, June's uncle, for instance, Carlos, uh, worked in the county attorney's office uh, here in Tucson. The local police instituted a citywide manhunt for June, but came up, but that manhunt came up empty. Thousands of Tucsonans helped to search for June in the days after the kidnapping. In Washington, J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the uh, FBI, got wind of what happened here in Tucson. He was upset that the local Tucson police had not contacted the FBI in Washington, but nonetheless decided on his own that the FBI should get involved with the case. Within a couple of days after the, the kidnapping happened, the FBI sent several agents to Tucson. The local police and the FBI did not always cooperate well in their search for the missing girl. In fact, that may be an understatement. Despite the squabbles among law enforcement, both local officers and federal agents began looking for evidence, interviewing witnesses and potential suspects and searching the city for June. Both the FBI and June's parents encouraged June's grandfather to pay the ransom money, to pay the $15,000, uh, which he could have done, um, but he refused. When the money was not immediately forthcoming from her grandfather, the kidnappers contacted the family again. They assured the family that June was still alive, but they again demanded the $15,000 uh, for her safe return. And again, her grandfather refused to pay the ransom. Finally, after 19 days, almost three weeks, a note arrived with a Chicago postmark at the governor's office in Phoenix. The mysterious note gave directions to where June was being held. The governor's staff, when they received it, they gave the note to a uh, local police officer in Phoenix who immediately sped down to Tucson and delivered the note to the Pima County attorney, uh, a man named Clarence Houston. Houston notified his colleague, Carlos Robles, June's uncle, uh, about the note, telling where uh, his uh, niece was being held. And the two men raced to the spot where the note claimed that June was being kept. They searched for two hours in the desert. Neither had brought water and Carlos began to feel lightheaded. But suddenly, County Attorney Clarence Houston came across an iron box. Inside that box was little June Robles, six years old. And I just wanna read a, a couple of short passages uh, actually from the book so you can get it sort of get a sense of, um, of, of Paul's writing. 19 days had passed. Oops, sorry about that. 19 days had passed since the brown eyes of six-year-old June Robles had had to adjust to their new world inside a small metal cage buried beneath the Sonoran Desert. 19 days since the strange man had told her to quiet down and stop crying for her mother or he would give her a whipping. I didn't cry anymore, June recalled later. 
I didn't want them to hurt me. Here's another uh, short passage also describing um, events after she was discovered. June's life in the box was sleep, a sleep deprived ordeal, no matter the hour, but nights were the worst, particularly on the bare dirt floor. Her captors briefly provided a child's mattress and an uncovered pillow, but these were soon removed and replaced with four filthy, bad smelling burlap gunny sacks. And then there was the cold. Save on the hottest nights when the mean temperature was in the 80s and the interior of the pit remained so hot that June couldn't sleep at all. On most evenings, the outside temperature plunged into the 40s and 50s. And while it was warmer than that inside the box, for a six-year-old child clad only in a muslin petticoat and pink gingham dress, it was cold enough. Some nights she remained awake for another reason. I heard noises, she explained later, recalling the frightening sounds of animals uh, she could not name. So I just wanted to include a couple of passages just so you can sort of get a sense of, I, I think, I think um, Paul's writing, he, he's the details uh, that he provides um, are just uh, staggering sometimes. Um, despite the heat of late spring, June had survived for 19 days in the iron box in the desert. And here's a, here's a shot of, of it. There's Clarence Houston, the county attorney on the left, uh, and that's Gus Wallard, the, the local sheriff, the local Tucson uh, Pima County Sheriff. Um, so she was kept in this, this iron box that was buried beneath the desert floor. She was bruised and bitten by bugs, but otherwise she had remained healthy. Having not eaten much, she had seemed to lose some weight uh, and she was sleep deprived as I just read from that passage. Uh, but otherwise the kidnappers had not harmed her. Her uncle Carlos and his boss Clarence Houston immediately took her home after discovering her in the iron box. June of course was glad to be home and her parents were relieved to have her back. After being rescued, the FBI continued to search for her kidnappers. J. Edgar Hoover the FBI, as I mentioned earlier, and he was on a mission to grow into the premier law enforcement agency in the country. The FBI worked especially hard to capture the gangsters of the era, people like John Dillinger and Pretty Boy Floyd and Babyface Nelson, but they also focused quite a bit on kidnappings. Hoover wanted the FBI to have a perfect solve rate for kidnappings. He wanted 100%. So he wanted them all solved. Going into 1934, the FBI did have a perfect solve rate, but the June Robles case would, would challenge that perfect solve rate. The investigation lasted for over two years. The FBI never put as much manpower on the case as they should have. To make matters worse, the FBI had only two Spanish speaking agents in the entire bureau making it tough to work a case in Tucson, especially among uh, Mexican-Americans in the community. The FBI chased down dozens of potential leads and interviewed dozens of suspects. But ultimately there were two main theories about the case. And I'd like to present both theories to you here today and um, see what you think. So the first theory, some people at the time wondered whether a family member did it, perhaps as a way to extort money uh, from the family patriarch, June's grandfather. The FBI considered this theory and investigated several members of the Robles family. So we might call this the inside job theory. As I mentioned earlier, June came from a large and prominent Mexican-American family. Her grandfather was one of the wealthiest men in Tucson in this period. His children never struck it rich like he did, but some of them were uh, moderately successful uh, in their professions. June's grandfather uh, married her grandmother in 1888, and the couple raised seven children together. Their two youngest children were twins, born in 1904, uh, June's father, Fernando, and her uncle, Carlos. 
While Fernando owned his own business, the Robles Electric Company here in Tucson, uh, Carlos went into a career in the law. He graduated from the University of Arizona Law School in 1929 and immediately took a job in the county's, county attorney's office in Tucson, where his boss was county attorney Clarence Houston. Less than three years later, he, uh, after taking the job, uh, he became deputy county attorney for Pima County. So he was uh, in the position right below Clarence Houston, who was county attorney. This uh, theory of the case, this inside job theory, um, involves uh, June's uncle Carlos and Clarence Houston in particular. There are two possibilities within this inside job theory. Um, one, is that, one is that a family member like Carlos did it in order to get money out of their uh, notoriously stingy um, father and grandfather. Um, the other possibility is that it was a hoax, um, that it was perpetrated to gain media attention. This hoax scenario uh, involves particularly uh, Uncle Carlos and county attorney Clarence Houston. And the idea is that, is that they pulled, pulled, uh, pulled off this kidnapping in order to then rescue her uh, and become heroes. Both men were politically ambitious. Uh, and so this, this theory goes, both men would have, would have wanted this, the media attention that came from, from rescuing this little girl and being the, the heroes who discovered six-year-old June in the iron box. One of the lead uh, FBI investigators on the case uh, wrote a, an internal memo to FBI director J. Edgar Hoover uh, to say that the, the FBI was not overlooking any possibility that current suspicion and rumors relative to hoax or inside job may prove to be well-founded. So the FBI did investigate uh, this idea that it was an inside job uh, and that potentially that it was done simply to, to gain media attention for the, the rescuers. So let's uh, briefly look at some of the, the, the facts and some of the arguments uh, for this, this theory. So the, the first is that June was kept in the iron box in the desert in very hot temperatures. This is late April early May for 19 days, but emerged relatively unscathed and unharmed. So the question that, that we could ask is, if, if this had been a real abduction, again, if we're thinking this is a sort of a hoax, if, if this had been a real abduction, abduction would she have been uh, in as good of shape as she, as she was after 19? days of living in, in a box in the desert in hot temperatures. So that's one, that's one question. Uh, the, second, um, the second point, after about two and a half weeks, no ransom money had been paid by June's grandfather, but the kidnappers just gave up. And they sent a letter, or somebody sent a letter from Chicago to the governor's office in Phoenix, just giving up the location of June. And it was the right location. So we could question, um, was this the behavior of, of real kidnappers? Would, would, would real kidnappers just sort of give up after about two and a half weeks uh, and just send the location uh, to the governor's office like that? Again, another, another question. Uh, the third point under this theory, uh, Carlos Robles and Clarence Houston uh, went alone to the site where June was kept. You know, they, Carlo, uh, Clarence Houston got the letter giving her location. He immediately went and found June's uh, uncle Carlos uh, and they immediately went to the site. They did not take any police with them or anybody else, just the two of them went as, as soon as uh, Clarence got the letter. So some, some questions could emerge from that. Did they do 
this to cover something up? Did they go by themselves to cover something up? Or possibly did they do this so only they would look like heroes, the heroes who discovered June? Uh, and the fourth point, uh, June initially uh, identified Clarence Houston as her abductor when being interviewed by the FBI. She didn't know his name, but she pointed him out to one of the FBI agents. She said, that's the guy who kidnapped me. And she was adamant that he was the guy. At a later interview with FBI agents, she recanted this identification. So was June right the first time, wrong the first time? Did her family ask her to recant? Or was she just um, confused in the initial interview where she ID Clarence Houston? We don't know. Uh, there's more that I could add that, that, that supports this theory, but um, I think this sort of gives you a, a, the, the gist. And of course, we hope you buy the book and, and read it for all the details um, that I can't include here. Um, and I would just say for me personally, um, at the very least, Carlos Robles and, and Clarence Houston uh, made a questionable decision to go to the site to get June themselves. They also exhibited some strange behavior during the 19 days she was missing and during the investigation. Um, there is some circumstantial evidence against them and certainly June's statement naming Clarence Houston um, could have been explosive had she not re recanted later. All right, the second theory uh, of the case uh, involves a, a low-life grifter uh, named Oscar Robeson. Oscar was born in, in 1903 in Lordsburg, New Mexico. Uh, his father had emigrated here from England. His mother was the daughter of a New Mexico rancher um, who had become quite, quite wealthy in New Mexico. The family moved to Tucson in 1920 when Oscar was 17 years old. During his junior year of high school, Oscar became acquainted with a classmate named Carlos Robles, June's uncle. Uh, and they became, um, you know, acquaintances, uh, sort of friends. Uh, so he clearly knew that Carlos's father uh, was wealthy. After dropping out of high school, Oscar took a job as a railroad clerk with the Southern Pacific Railroad uh, and married his high school sweetheart. A couple of kids soon followed, but Oscar grew bored of the settled domestic life uh, and soon began living life in the fast lane. With financial help from his mother, he opened a nightclub in Tucson called the Silver Slipper. Oscar soon quit his day job with the railroad uh, to devote all of his energies to the nightclub. Unfortunately for Oscar, he did this at a bad time, right before the stock market crashed in the fall of 1929. His nightclub went under and he and his wife and kids moved in with his mother at her ranch in Oro Valley, just north of Tucson. The marriage didn't last much longer than the nightclub and the couple divorced in 1932. Now single again, Oscar increasingly became addicted to fast women and fast money. He continued to live with his mother, but the Robeson Ranch in Oro Valley became a haven for ne'er-do-wells like Oscar. Oscar soon opened another nightclub, which also failed. And then he tried to run a ranch for out of town visitors, a, a resort ranch, um, and that business also failed. So in other words, he was not a good businessman. And besides, he just sort of preferred uh, drinking and carousing and, and he did not really particularly like working. He eventually got back together with his ex-wife but continued to womanize and drink heavily. So just as we did for uh, the other theory, uh, let's briefly look at some of the, the facts and the arguments 
in favor of this theory that the hard drinking, hard partying, failed businessman, Oscar Robeson did it. And then again, a guy who, who knew the Robles family uh, and knew that June's grandfather was wealthy. Uh, so the first point, uh, by the spring of 1934, as the, the time when June was kidnapped, Robeson had had a string of failed businesses and was living off of his mother. He lived off a girlfriend uh, for a while and later lived off of his ex-wife. So he wanted money, but he also wanted freedom. So did he commit this crime to, to not only... Uh, to, to make some money, um, but to be able to support himself and not live off of his mother or a, a girlfriend or his, his ex-wife. To you know, he he wanted money to be able to continue to to party. The second point: after he was arrested and interrogated by the FBI, he was told to give them a handwriting sample. The FBI's handwriting expert positively identified his handwriting as the one on the ransom notes. Another handwriting expert, one of the most respected handwriting experts in the country who, who did not work for the FBI, disagreed and said that the handwriting was not Robeson's handwriting. But the FBI's expert, handwriting expert, never wavered in his opinion that the handwriting belonged to Oscar Robeson, the handwriting on the, the ransom notes. The third point, a portion of an envelope was found in the iron box after June, June was, was rescued. So just a small little portion of an envelope with a little bit of writing on it. The FBI investigators were able to figure out where it was mailed from and to whom it was mailed. It was mailed from Chicago, possibly a coincidence, but that's the same place that the letter uh, sent to the governor, governor's office, uh, giving June's location uh, came from. And it was mailed to a friend of Robeson's, another petty criminal who was uh, part of Robeson's uh, circle of, of hard partying friends. And finally, the fourth uh, point in the, in the building this, this theory, uh, a witness placed Oscar Robeson near the site of the iron box. Arizona. Oscar uh, and his wife knew the professor's housekeeper, and the professor and Oscar had met on at least one occasion. So the professor knew what Oscar looked like. So did Oscar and his alibi lie about him being in Phoenix, or did the professor lie? Uh, or possibly misidentify uh, Oscar Robeson. So just to sort of to sort of wrap this up, uh, the the FBI investigated the case uh, for two years. They interviewed dozens, perhaps hundreds of people during the investigation. Uh, they let many potential leads go by the wayside because they were um, understaffed. Not just uh, you know around the country they were they were understaffed not just here in Tucson. Uh, this potentially hampered the effort to solve the case, but they eventually fixated on one suspect, Oscar Robeson, the the local petty criminal. They arrested and interrogated Robeson. When the case went before the Pima County Grand Jury, uh, the the new county attorney it was no longer Clarence Houston. Uh, and the FBI failed to get an indictment against Oscar Robeson. But J. Edgar Hoover, remember, wanted a perfect solve rate 
for kidnappings. He wanted to be able to claim that the FBI solved all of their kidnapping cases that they investigated. So the FBI dropped their, their, the investigation, stopped, stopped the investigation, and claimed that the whole thing had been a hoax after they were unable to indict Oscar Robeson. They claimed that a family member, perhaps June's uncle Carlos and his close friend Clarence Houston had perpetrated the hoax to garner attention. Uh, both men, as I mentioned, had political ambitions and it would certainly look good for them to rescue young June. So the FBI forgot about Oscar Robeson and continued to investigate this idea that it was an inside job and that it was a hoax. To this day, no one knows who kidnapped six-year-old June Robles in the spring of 1934, why they put her in an iron box in the middle of the desert, whether or not she was actually in that box for, for a full 19 days or not. Maybe she was, maybe she wasn't. Uh, so we, there's a lot that we don't know. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence. Um, and so the author of this, this book, uh, Paul Kuhl, I, I think does an, does an excellent job at the conclusion of the book. Um, he offers his, his own opinion um, based on his reading of, of the evidence that's available uh, from FBI records. In particular, he, he combed through a lot of FBI records. So he, he offers his own, own thoughts, but he really asks uh, readers to draw their own conclusions about um, what actually happened and um, who perpetrated this, this crime. Um, so I just, I'll leave it there uh, because we really want people to read the book um, and, and think about it and, and come to your own conclusions. Um, so thank, thank you all for listening and I'm uh, happy to do my best to, uh, to answer questions. Um, again, I'm, I'm, not the, I'm not the author, but uh, I was the editor of the book. So I, I read it um, many, many times and I, I'll do my best to, to answer questions if, if you have any. Thank you. Uh, I had uh, one question from uh, the audience was, uh, can you tell us a little bit, uh, whoa, I'm sorry, I'm getting lots of feedback here. Um, about uh, June? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I mean, she, so she was six years old um, in, I, uh, I believe, first or second grade, I think, uh, when the kidnapping occurred. Um, you know, from what, from what uh, Paul Poole, the author, was able to, to discover, um, she was a, a, a bright young girl, um, you know, just sort of a normal six-year-old kid. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, maybe a little shy. Um, of course, some of those impressions come from uh, FBI agents who interviewed her uh, after she was uh, rescued. Um, so a lot of the evidence that we have uh, about her comes comes from those FBI reports. Um, and so, you know, who knows um, exactly whether they, you know, it, 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 the reports are told through through those FBI agents' uh, um, perceptions. Um, and and um, the FBI believed um, that the family, uh, the Robles family, her parents, um, after, after a couple of interviews with the FBI, um, the FBI believed that her, her family um, sort of told her to be tight-lipped. Um, and she was, she was less forthcoming um, after the first couple interviews. And it, so who knows why, right? I mean, that's, that's a it's a question um, that, that we don't know an answer to. Uh, were they trying to hide something that's, that's possible? Or were they just tired of having their, their child interviewed over and over again uh, by FBI agents? And um, maybe she just wanted to forget about it and, and move on. And um, so, so we don't know. Um, and, and June um, lived uh, a long life, lived, uh, I believe she, passed away in 2013 or 14. Uh, so she lived into old age um, and never talked about the, the kidnapping uh, again after, after, the, um, after being interviewed by the FBI a couple times. Um, she was interviewed um, 
by the BBC. There's a clip. I, I think you can go on YouTube and uh, type in June Robles, and it, it'll it'll probably pop up. Um, I believe it was the BBC. Um, but there's a yeah. You can see you can see her giving a short interview um, if you go on YouTube. Um, but after that, she really didn't um, she really didn't talk about it um, much. So. Um, we don't know a, a whole lot about her, just a few impressions from, from FBI agents uh, at, at the time. That's really cool. I was in the chat box. Um, one of the attendees uh, wrote that, thank you for sharing the story. And June was her great aunt and her sister Sylvia was her grandmother. So this is kind of a, a personal story for one of our, our, uh, our attendees. So thank you so much uh, uh, for sharing that and everything. Um, yeah, no, and it you. says other relatives are also listening to this call. So I hope they 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 uh, got the book and because it really is kind of a fascinating read. And if you're interested in a true crime or you know, Hoover right plays a plays a pretty big deal in this in this book, and so does Tucson, a very young, uh, dusty town uh, back in 1934. Um. Again, if you have any other questions, please uh, feel free to put them in the in the chat box. Uh, I was uh, had a question about uh, speaking of Tucson being kind of a, a dusty little town and everything. Uh, how was the police work, or you know, the small city of Tucson? Uh, how did that affect the the investigation with uh, Hoover's uh, G men? Yeah, that's a great question, and and uh, yeah, Paul Paul goes into that quite a bit uh, in the book it's it's really fascinating I, mean, I think if you know if, if you're a fan of law and order uh, or a show like that I think um, most people would enjoy this this book um, so yeah the the the, the local police force um, back then it, it you know um, police police work was not necessarily what we would call professional um, the the they were still learning um, professional techniques of how to gather evidence and, and properly store evidence. Um, so just to give, give an example, um, once they, once uh, June was discovered, um, some workers dug the iron box that she was kept in out, um, dug it out from the desert um, and brought it to uh, the Tucson, the main, main police station in town. Um, and a few days later, the public was allowed to walk through and see it and, and touch it. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that the, there was just sort of all of that evidence, you know, that the, just any possibility of getting fingerprints um, from the box or any of the evidence that was kept in the box, you know, there were, there were food wrappers and, um, uh, you know, uh, drink cans and, and all sorts of, you know, all sorts of trash. And, you know, like I mentioned, a, a little piece of an envelope there were, you know, the, the, the kidnappers, um, you know, gave food to June and drink to June and they, they left some trash in there uh, for some reason. Um, so all that evidence was sort of spread out on a table and the, the iron box was put on a table and people could, could walk, walk into the police station and just touch it. Um, so, you know, I, you know I, it was just, I don't want to use the word shoddy. I mean, they just didn't, they didn't have the sort of the same standards that that um, we have today um, about about maintaining evidence. Uh, um, so the FBI, though, was just slowly starting to develop that kind of professionalization uh, in the 1930s. Uh, Hoover was a proponent of, of that. Um, I mentioned, um, you know, that the FBI actually had a handwriting expert, for instance. Um, they had a forensic lab at the time. It was something that was that was fairly new. Um, and so the FBI agents who came to town were um, sort of shocked and horrified um, by the, the local police work um, that was happening here. Um, and so there was some friction because of that. There was some friction about, you know, these, these people coming from, from outside to, to our, you know, our community. And, um, you know, what do they know about Tucson? And, um, you know, and, and um, you know, who, again, who knows? It's perception is... Is what it is, but you know, perhaps the FBI agents did come in and, and were a little arrogant and um, 
so so who knows but yeah there was absolutely there was um there was some friction and there was some um it was unfortunate how some of the evidence uh, was not well preserved um on the fbi side though of course as i mentioned um the fbi did not put the resources into this case that they they should have at least that's that's what paul cool the conclusion that that he came to um you know there were there were only a when the when the when the FBI initially came here to Tucson, um, there were only a handful of agents sent. Um, at any given time, there was maybe one agent who spoke Spanish uh, that sent here to Tucson. Um, and at, you know, after after a little while, June, you know, June was discovered, and sort of the case was no longer in the headlines anymore. Um, and and at, for I said the investigation lasted for two years. Uh, for most of that time, there were maybe two or three FBI agents here uh, in Tucson who were um, investigating the case. Um, and they they missed a lot too. So I don't mean to, to say that it was the, uh, the local police who um, were the only ones who missed some things or, or had problems. Uh, there, were, there were problems with the FBI too. They, they, there were people that they could have interviewed uh, that they didn't interview um, just because they didn't, at, at the very least, because they didn't have the manpower. Uh, so there, so there were problems all around in the investigation, and then uh, because Hoover wanted his perfect solve rate right at, at the end, he just sort of found a way to to kind of brush it under the rug and claim that they solved it, and it was just a hoax, and the, the that some family member had done it. So um, Hoover claimed that as a victory, uh, as a solve. So. And remember, this is uh, what two years after the Lindbergh kid kidnapping, where they had really kind of founded these scientific uh, ideas, right? So it just didn't quite work here in in Tucson as much. Um, couple of questions. First one from, uh, that I got, did the grandfather give a reason why he didn't want to pay the ransom? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't think so. Um, I think um, from what I, rem I remember, um, um, Paul Cool uh, gives speculates as to why uh, he didn't um, pay the ransom. Um, there's some circumstantial evidence as, as to why maybe he didn't. Um, uh, you know that that um, he he. I mean, he was notoriously stingy. I mean, so that's that's one issue. I mean, he was not um, fond of just sort of handing money over to uh, his his kids. Um, he had a he had a uh, before he was married. Um, to June's grandmother, um, in in his youth, he had had a sort of string of affairs and had several Ill illegitimate uh, children from those affairs, um, and so those kids were sort of always hitting hitting him up for money. Um, his his kids with his wife were often hitting him up for money. Um, so I think he was just sort of you know stingy because everybody was coming to him and and sort of wanting wanting money from him. Um, uh, but I, I'm I'm trying to remember. I think I think um, yeah. Paul has a has a, some speculates as to why um, he didn't. Um, I don't I don't remember exactly. Um, but I think just him being him being stingy was was part of it. it I mean, it seems it seems awfully cold hearted. I mean, I, I you know I don't want to. Um, who knows? I, I don't know. But um, on the surface, it certainly seems like he should have paid. I always wondered if then maybe he knew it was an inside job kind of thing, you know, that well, he knew that his brother or somebody was behind it and that they wouldn't hurt June, right? Right, certainly that's, yeah, that's, that's uh, we could speculate that for sure, yeah. Um, another comment, not really a question, that Tucson law enforcement should have been ready to, after capturing Dillinger in January. It's kind of amazing that, uh, you know, FBI, like the Lindbergh, kidnapping is happening right now, right? The the trial, uh, Bruno Hopman. And then we have the June Robles case and then you have Dillinger, right? And it's just amazing that Tucson kind of is, is fitting into this FBI, this new, this new G-men, uh, you know, I think we kind of forget that Hoover was kind of uh, instrumental in creating this FBI and so many points point to Tucson. Um, another question uh, is that you think the you, you kind of hinted about that about one FBI agent speaking Spanish, right? Uh, I think it was also cultural ignorance, maybe. Can you point to that of the FBI coming, you know, from the East Coast to 
uh, Tucson, which had, you know, a pretty uh, a robust middle class Mexican American businessmen families here. Uh, definitely bilingualism. Uh, Robles was a well known Tucsonian, right? Uh, Mexican American. Do you think that played a, a part in the the lack of of progress in this case? I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, I mean, Laura, you probably know more, more about that than I do, since that's your area of, of study. But um, so, yeah, feel free to, to add to what I say. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, absolutely. I mean, it, uh, um, Paul, Paul talks about that quite a bit, how it was uh, very detrimental to the to the FBI investigation, um, you know, that that they were outsiders. Um, they didn't understand the, the local community, particularly the Mexican American community here in Tucson, um, and that they, you know, just um, made sort of a, a very, it's a, maybe it's even just kind of me to say this, but uh, they made a half-hearted effort um, um, in terms of the investigation, uh, conducting interviews in, in Spanish. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, um, you know, we, I, I don't know that we have a lot of direct evidence that that hindered the case, but I think it's um, pretty clear from a lot of the, the circumstantial evidence that, that Paul uncovered um, while digging through the FBI files that, that there were a lot of people who were, um, were tight-lipped and, and less, less than forthcoming um, because, because of those reasons. Right. And I think it's also important to know that the years are really important. We have 34 here, right? And then the investigation, which is right in the middle of the Depression, which is right in the middle of uh, repatriation drives, where the local governments and federal government to an extent are asking uh, Mexicans, Mexican Americans to repatriate back to Mexico. So there is a, and while there's not large scale repatriation here in Tucson as there was in Los Angeles or in Texas, El Paso, and uh, uh, there were repatriation drives in, in Phoenix, right? So that distrust between Mexican American community that preferred to work within their own, right? With mutualistas and among themselves and then seeing an outside, especially federal agents, I imagine, you know, that that placed a, a real hindrance on on law, not only just local law enforcement, but especially the FBI coming in here as outsiders that many witnesses maybe, uh, you know, saw something but wouldn't come forward because of that fear of being repatriated. Um, another question, was Robeson or a connection to him placed in Chicago to mail the letter? That's a great question. Um, he, he could not be place there. Oscar um, could not be placed in Chicago, um, but he certainly, he had a lot of acquaintances, uh, friends, other, other um, sort of petty criminals uh, around town uh, who had connections um, all over the country. And there was, um, there was one of his uh, friends in particular, um, the FBI discovered, um, had, had family or some sort of connections in, in Chicago. And so as the, during their investigation, they sort of assumed, as they were as they were targeting Robeson and in their investigation, they assumed that it was that that friend's connections in in Chicago um, who, who mailed the letter. And of course, there was that uh, the, the letter that sort of describing where June was located. But then there was that other envelope, that piece of an envelope that was discovered in in the iron box um, as part of the evidence that was collected. Um, that they also connected to one of Robeson's friends and um, also connected to Chicago. Um, so, yeah. Um. It would be fascinating to use modern day detective to reopen this case. And I, you know, I don't know if uh, I, we don't have like any of the physical things from this case, but it would be fascinating if, you know, Pima County had it, uh, you know, to reopen this case, it could be one of these, these uh, unsolved mysteries kind of thing, because this really is fascinating. Um, oh, uh, follow up to that one question, was the kidnappers note handwriting and the Chicago letters handwriting the same? No, they were, they were different. Uh, did they figure out why they put her in the desert instead of keeping her in a house? No, no, that's a great question, though. No, um, uh, yeah, that, that, um, or at least, at least um, the author doesn't doesn't talk about that at all. So, yeah, there must not have been any evidence um, 
they did find that she was um, when they when they discovered her, um, she was chained uh, to the iron uh, box. There was uh, some sort of a shackle attached to her one of her uh, ankles, um, and she was chained to a a post that was connected to the iron box. And they thought they found the the ranch that the post may have originally come from. But that that um, that sort of didn't lead anywhere, but it seemed it seemed promising for a while as as the FBI was investigating it. So there's all sorts of these little, little sort of clues that they find, and then and then they sort of don't go anywhere in, in the end. You know, there's so there's lots of this this evidence that sort of could point to Oscar Robeson or people he knows and in, in his sort of circle of friends. Um, and then all you know, all the evidence against Clarence Houston and, and June's uncle is um, is circumstantial. Um, but it's um, you know, pretty strong circumstantial evidence in some cases, or, or, or maybe not strong, but uh, interesting and compelling uh, circumstantial evidence uh, against them. Uh, one more. Uh, why do they not think she was in the box for 19 days? Well, some people, qu so we don't know. I mean, some, you know, she claimed that she was there the whole time. Um, she never wavered from that every time she was interviewed uh, by the FBI. Uh, so she said she was there for 19 days. Um, but some people question that at the time. Some, some FBI agents questioned it. Um, the author of this book, Paul Kuhl, um, at least um, brings up the question. He doesn't, he doesn't, um, he doesn't give an answer because we don't, we don't have the evidence to give an answer. But um, so some people question whether she was in, in there for 19 days, um, because when she emerged, um, as I think I mentioned, you know, she was a little bit lighter. She looked like she had maybe lost a couple of pounds because she hadn't eaten much um, for three weeks, almost three weeks. Um, she had a few scratches on her. Uh, the, the, her ankle was um, scratched because of the shackle, uh, but otherwise she looked, she looked fine. Um, and this was, this was um, as I said, late April, early May. The temperatures during the day were getting up into the 90s, um, maybe even close to, uh, Paul actually gives some of the, the temperatures. He, he looked it up in the, the local newspaper um, back then. And so he actually has the temperatures. And I think it got close to 100 uh, on, one, on at least one of those days, um, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so it was hot um, for 19 days, and then it get, get it's cold at night and uh, there's a, uh, you know, critters out there in the desert. Um, so, you know, some people said, was she really in this box for 19 days? Boy, she, lo she looks pretty good after um, being stuck in this box for 19 days. So it's, it's just a, it's just a question that some people have. I mean, she, she said she was there the whole time, but um, it's just some people have raised that question. Yeah, somebody asked, you know, where is the evidence now? I'm pretty sure you said like that we just don't know of that so ahs doesn't have any any like the iron box i guess yeah so um, i mean i think eventually at some point all of the evidence was sent to the fbi lab in washington um, yeah to, to so be analyzed um so i don't know if the fbi keeps uh, well they solved it didn't you say that they said that they solved it it was a hoax so i don't right. even know if they keep the evidence after that if they know that it's solved so yeah um, yeah yeah and ha another question was how did she breathe i was thinking that same thing i i have no idea yeah there i mean there were so this box this uh was constructed um did have some um like parts of it were i don't i don't know how to, to best like sort of wire mesh i guess and so there there was sort of breathable and i don't think it was completely uh buried by the desert floor you know they sort of the people who, who did it dug a did dig a sort of a trench and put the box in it and they they covered a portion of it but not all of it because um you know so that there there was sort of a a, a door that a small door that could open you saw that i, I have a I had that picture of clarence yeah. houston houston where he was standing inside of it so that's the sort of wire mesh um door that could sort of open so that the kidnappers could could give her food and and drink um and because according to june they they came uh during the 19 days uh she was there they they came four or five times uh something like that to to give her food and and drink um 
so it, it you know obviously uh um, not a good situation but I, I guess breathable at least what an amazing story so i've had a couple uh people say this book said this sounds amazing so once again in the uh, you can buy this book at the gift shop at any of our our museums and uh in the chat is a link to our online store hs online store so you can purchase this there because obviously we can't go through all of the what ifs. I think that's what you, what I got away from this lecture is it really, it's like a choose your own adventure book, right? There's just so many avenues and you get to kind of make your own decision about what actually happened. So we couldn't go through all of it in this hour, but uh, we got some really good teasing points that hopefully people will pick up this, this book. So uh, we're actually out of time. Uh, unless anybody has anything uh, last to say, Dr. Turpy or, uh, thank you for bringing this story out, and uh, I don't think a lot of people know about this story, so it's really uh, an, a, amazing that AHS can bring this. So please pick up the book, and uh, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody, and thank you for joining us for another AHS program. Uh, check out our website. We've got some great programs coming up, so uh, thank you once again, and I uh, hope to see you all in person one day. Thank you, Dr. Terpy. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Take care, everybody.